Good morning, everyone. My clock and the clock at the wall says it's 9 o'clock. So maybe I'll start slowly. Hopefully, you didn't party too hard. And uh, if you really did and need to lay your head down to sleep a little bit, that's OK. <laughs> I know how it is sometimes with party. <coughs> so I'm giving a talk what's up in the lin uh, land of the Linux kernel. You might wonder. Is it guy standing there actually a reliable source? And uh, if you look at the kernel commits, uh, he's not. I actually have, <laughs> I have actually two, two commits in the kernel, and uh, the third one is actually on the way to port, uh, port 5.1. And these are actually quite small commits. The, the, uh, the third one that's actually on the way, that's a proper commit. Uh, so that's uh, the, uh, the reason why you should uh, uh, run out of here immediately. The reason why you should stay is that I'm covering the Linux kernel as a journalist um, for about 15 years now. I'm doing it quite throughoutly. Actually, I'm, because I'm a journalist for a German uh, computer ma magazine, uh, quite well-known German computer magazines. We still have those there. Um, actually, my stuff was translated to English um, at, on the H Open for a while, but that closed down a few years ago. But some of you might remember it. The other reason why I might be considered a reliable source is because I was or I am involved in the, um, in the Linux kernel development a little bit. I did regression tracking for the Linux kernel. That's so if you had a problem and told it to kernel developers, sometimes they, get, they fell through the cracks, and I try to make sure they are not forgotten. But I did, did that in the spare time, and right now I don't find time for it. I hope, hopefully, I, I, I find time for it again. Uh, maybe sooner or later, even somebody might pay me a little bit for, to do that, we may, may, maybe then I can find more time. But anyway, we're here to listen on, and learn about what's happening in the Linux kernel, a quick orientation. Um, the, the Linux kernel development is working like a well-tuned engine. That are actually not my words. That's what uh, Jonathan Corbett from LWMNet always said. I, it's fitted quite well. That's why I picked it up. And. Uh, to show that the uh, new uh, releases of the Linux kernel come out every nine weeks, and sometimes if there are some big problems or something, then it might take a, a week longer, and in rare occasionally, in rare occasions, um, it might take even uh, 11 weeks. <coughs> Each of the new kernel brings about uh, 13,500 changes, sometimes one or 2,000 more, sometimes a little bit less. And on average, um, the Linux kernel sources grow by about 300,000 lines each release. And I think we are uh, above the 25 million lines of code uh, limit these days. Um, you might know this page from the uh, Linux, <coughs> from kernel.org, that shows what's um, um, actually cooking. To give, get, get into a little bit more deta detail, is Linux 5.0 is under development. Uh, small reminder, 5.0 sounds like a big new version, but it's not. It's just an, another name for, for 4.21. Uh, it's just like if the second number grows too big, if Linus, he says always, if he, if he um, has not enough uh, fingers and toes to, to count, then he switches the first number. So 5.0 is an ordinary uh, kernel, even if there's um, a zero in it. The release is actually expected at the February, February 25th or maybe a week later. 4.20 is the latest Linux kernel right now, or 4.20.5 to be precise. Uh, it actually was merged into Linux, uh, into Fedora 29 about a week ago as a proper update. And uh, Fedora 28 gets, is right now, it's in testing, so it will get it soon. 5.19 is the latest long-term kernel. Long-term kernels normally get um, released, uh, get supported for about two years. Uh, the 4.20 is maybe just for uh, three months about uh, supported, but 4.19 for two years um, because it's a long-term kernel. Actually, it will be used in Debian 10 Buster, which some of you might, might use. And because it's used there, it's likely that the Debian maintainer will pick up the support for this kernel and give it uh, support until uh, Debian, Debian 10 is supported. That's basically five to six years about. That's at least what happened in the last few times. And there are actually a few kernels um, that the Linux kernel developers <coughs> themselves um, support for six years these days. You can find information about that on, um, on kernel.org if you want to know more. 
RHEL 8, which is in beta right now, if you're curious, uh, the kernel is based on Linux 4.18. Actually, um, uh, it was already modified, like, like it's all, always the case for uh, RHEL. Uh, upstream, actually, this kernel is not supported anymore, but that doesn't matter much to Red Hat. They support the, that kernel themselves anyway. So what's happening in the Linux kernel world recently? <coughs> As I said, well-tuned engine, but there were a few hiccups recently. Um, one of them that was directly in the kernel, it was more related. Um, that was in January, um, ZFS on Linux uh, stopped working with the first pre-release from uh, uh, Linux 5.0. And um, that's happened due to some housekeeping tasks. The Linux kernel developers removed something uh, ZFS on Linux needs something uh, related to using your the, um, uh, floating point unit in your CPUs. And that's, that happens um, sometimes um, because ZFS on Linux is under a different license from the kernel. Um, it can't get merged into the kernel proper. And, um, and the kernel developers just don't care what ZFS on Linux does and then that's why they remove this. It's something ZFS on Linux has to deal with. Actually, it, they, what they removed, there's some, some replacement for it, but it's um, exported on, with a special tag. So it's only legal to use it for modules that are GPL licensed or GPL, uh, com compatible to GPL. And um, yeah, that's why uh, ZFS on Linux can't use it. Work up, workaround for ZFS on Linux is under discussion. What, um, um, it hasn't been much, I haven't checked in the last two, three days yet, but I don't think it was. The thing is, um, because you can't use the FPU anymore, it might have um, a performance impact because they used the floating point unit for checksumming. <coughs> um, but maybe the performance impact won't be that big. But it's a good reminder why relying on ZFS on Linux has risks, so you should think about it <coughs> a little bit more than it's, instead of blindly using it. Um, while talking about this GPL exports for the Linux kernel, I want to mention Linux 5.0 removes another export or a few, few other um, uh, exports that uh, <coughs> are used for, that are important for uh, heterogeneous memory management. That's uh, basically uh, what a lot of you might heard, have heard from AMD with the fusion stuff, like uh, all the different chips in your computer that have their own memory to make a, a big giant, giant address space so it's easier to move things around and to, to um, from the CPU, for example, to get data from your uh, uh, GPU memory. <coughs> and um, uh, that's what HMM is for. And um, there was also an, an export that they could use up till now. And uh, that was changed so to make it only available to GPL modules and um, so uh, that will be important for GPL. Um, it got nearly no attention, but it might be more important than the ZFS on Linux stuff because uh, the NVIDIA stuff is important and, and HMM, HMM is for uh, high performance computing, artificial age <laughs> intelligence and machine learning. Remains to be seen how that works out. And what's even more important and unusual, this, expo uh, this exports were changed in retrospect, because they existed and they were changed to GPL exports, and um, that's normally not not the case. That normally doesn't happen. Normally, that's only if you do do some housekeeping, some improvements in the Linux kernel, you can change that. But in this case, it wasn't like that for for some reasons that I explained on LWNet. If you want, if you are curious, but these GPL exports were actually were backported. So even older kernels like 4.14 and 4.19 now get remo uh, removed these exports and um, might break uh, some use case NVIDIA might have wanted to um, use the Linux kernel for. Actually, it doesn't break the, the graphics driver right now because the HMM stuff is not uh, finished there yet. That's why it's not built up to now. Another hiccup that recently happened with the well-tuned engine is a block corruption uh, bug that was in 4.19. That actually happened in November. It was a hard-to-trigger to um, bug in the Linux kernel when you have 
under, under, under low memory restrictions or something like that. Um, uh, there's, um, the, 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 uh, there was something not written properly to disk and some corrupt, corruption occurred. In the beginning, it was suspected that it was an X4 bug, but it turned out to be something the block layer. What I want to say about that is, yeah, it's nothing to see here. Bugs happen, get fixed, please move along. That's some, the, the, the kernel developers, um, you can't stand still. They have to do and make improvements. And, um, um, and sometimes things will get wrong because in this case, it was really hard to trigger. So it's um, uh, things like that happen. You have to, have to be prepared for that. And we all have backups, don't we? Do you? <laughs> for me, it was at least a good reminder to check my backup strategy. <laughs> Don't let that scare you off. Um, there will always be bugs. And if uh, nobody tests this kernel throughout, uh, nobody will find that those bugs, and the kernel will get worse in any way. So just make sure you have backups and don't get scared, and try these modern kernels uh, in production even. There was another hiccup recently, it was also in November, there was a performance problem, a big one that made the news and was um, uh, mentioned in a lot of uh, internet uh, websites. That happened due to improved Spectre v2 migrations. You remember this, this um, big per performance bugs, uh, um, um, security uh, bugs that are in a lot of modern CPUs that were found about one year ago, early last year. Um, there was an improvement to this mitigation efforts uh, that got backported a little, little bit quickly, and um, that um, made the performance worse. So it was even in 4.19, 4.14, <coughs> for, for about one week or something. It got reverted there. In the end, uh, the story is um, the kernel developers already had worked on even more improvements in this area. So th those patches were revisited, quietly turned around and changed quite heavily. The performance was restored. The mitigation afterwards is even better. And the impo uh, um, um, mitigation patches were even backported too. So everything is fine. What the kernel developers learned from it that they are uh, in cases like this, keeping an eye towards performance to make sure something like that uh, doesn't happen again. Uh, I have a question about the, the performance when you enable the patches, the security mitigation. We have customers, so I work in support service delivery. We have customers reporting serious performance impacts when they enable the... Uh, Red pull line. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, the question was uh, about the performance impact of the Spectre v2 migration. Actually, we, and later in the talk, I'm talking about this. Um, but I can talk about this now. Um, um, they are right now in Linux 5.02 efforts to make um, the Spectre v2 mitigation l have less overhead. Um, some technique in the networking layer benefits from it. Um, and UDP package performance also gets, gets quicker. And there are actually two more, uh, um, two more um, improvements that kernel developers are working on to reduce the overhead of uh, the red line stuff that uh, ha ha introduced the performance problem. But in the end, it's, um, there is a bug in your CPU. Um, you, if you try to work around it by software, it will get slower. It's, uh, it's unavoidable, unavoidable. You can only try to reduce the impact as much as possible. Yeah. Let's move on to the next um, um, hiccup. That was Linus Brake and uh, the Code of Conduct. I think most of you have heard about it. That's why I'm not going too much into the details. It was in September, October. Made the web news sites throughout the up and down. Linus took a break to rethink his behavior towards others because with other developers, he was quite blunt sometimes. Like that, that was in uh, August. Actually. I found that really, really funny. Uh, but I was raised with uh, Monty Python, <laughs> because that's a, if you, if you uh, see this um, down here, it, it's, a, it's a quote from um, um, The Holy Grail. And if you know that movie, you, you will get that, and you know what he's referring to. But some people, I mean the modern generation, I, I'm, I would hope they learn about Monty Python, but I don't think they do. So it will get, people will get that wrong. And uh, it's just one example. 
Um, um, to be precise, I think Linus Torvalds improved his behavior in the last few years a lot already. Um, and I think if you're making such jokes bef um, among friends, that's not a problem. The problem is you're doing it in public, and there are lots of um, uh, websites. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's a complicated topic. Um, as you said, um, some people that are not involved come up and, and, and require changes. Um, but I get to that. Well, they start in Sufi, actually the developers, uh, who did so many work that they start, he sh shut up in the yeah. same place. Wait, wait a moment. I, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting to that. Actually, the, the, the thing is, uh, Linus, when, when he moved, he put a code of conduct in place. Uh, as you know, there are pretty popular these days, even this conference, some, and many confer other conferences have one these days, and actually left for a while, Greg Moore Hartman took over, and when he did that, a lot of bike shedding and concern uh, came up, uh, there were Reddit threads that were so big, and um, when the websites, uh, news sites reported about this, and lots of concern, um, but also the concerns were sometimes from people that are also not involved in the Linux kernel, but so, People that wanted the, that the uh, Linux kernel applies a code of conduct, um, uh, they <coughs> were not always members of the kernel community, and there were uh, people that required, uh, said they no no code of conduct that were also not not um, uh, part of the kernel community within the kernel community within the core team of the kernel developers is what the discussion was also heated but not that that much. Anyway. Um, the discussion worked somehow. Uh, it was the code of conduct was fine-tuned a little bit, and the surroundings were fine-tuned. There was a um, document added to to explain how the code of conduct is work, and there's a mediator now if there's something happening. And um, yeah, that's how it is. That uh, was the improvements came um, were uh, added to the kernel uh, to uh, four dot. Uh, oh, what was it? Nineteen? Nineteen? Right before it was finished. And Linus came, uh, came back as planned. Um, yeah. It didn't uh, silence uh, the discussion. There were still um, concerns and bike shedding. Uh, but in the end, what well, is perfect? If you would switch to a, from one, maybe from MIT license to GPL, there were discussions always. That's always the case. And the thing is, the Linux kernel developers, the core team, there was a kernel maintainers summit recently in October, uh, pretty much said. It will stay as it is for now, and we see how it works out. <laughs> and in the end, it's a signal like we are friendly here. And um, that's important these days uh, because due to the mails like the one I showed you earlier, Linux kernel has a bad reputation that needs to change because times change. And um, the, 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 uh, Linux, we, we are all not like 10 or 12, 15 years ago. Uh, code of conduct kind of is important these days. And to give an example um, how it is, is uh, also from Monty Brian, uh, uh, Monty Python. Uh, who knows this? I guess that's, that's um, from Life of Brian, <coughs> where she says, from now on, I want you to call me Loretta. That's a quite popular scene from that movie. Um, but I guess they wouldn't do that today. <laughs> because things change. Back in the 70s, when that, that movie was made, you could make fun of people that said, hey, well, I want you to call me Loretta. You wouldn't do that these days anymore. I mean, you can, but uh, um, I don't think you would because it's not, not for, for today's world, it's not appropriate anymore. And that's the same with the code of conduct in the Linux kernel. And in the end, remember, <laughs> if uh, problems of the code of conduct um, come up, it can always be revisited because it's still the old, I um, uh, wanted to say old, uh, uh, so the same old trusted people in control. It's, um, and uh, if there's something with uh, some problem with Linus and Greg Kuhl Hartman can say, okay, we change this to get to solve a situation uh, where, where the code of conduct turns out um, uh, to not work as intended. So don't worry too much about it. So that were already 10, 20 minutes about the Linux kernel. Quick distraction, why am I here? Uh, Few guys might know I, um, me from the old days, like Fedora, like 20 years ago. 
I did a lot of work in Fedora Extras back then when we had cool effects on the desktop. Uh, that was actually Fedora for six. Um, was the first non-Fesco chair not working for Red Hat and did a little bit in Apple and RPM Fusion bring up. And uh, these days I'm doing not that much anymore for Fedora. As I said, I'm doing the, the regression tracking that takes a lot, lot, lot of time. I'm also having a badminton club uh, I have to manage and my regular work also. So there's not much time anymore, but I'm still quite interested in Red Hat and Fedora. That's why I'm here. Uh, the one thing I'm still doing for Fedora is um, building um, vanilla kernels uh, for Fedora. Not doing this, in, not doing this in, in copper. I'm doing it actually publishing them on people.fedoraproject.org. There's actually a page in the wiki that shows how you can, can use those kernels. And um, actually, um, it's um, an easy way to simply run more up-to-date kernels. Um, like run the latest mainline kernel like 5.0 right now to check if there are bugs um, in there that the kernel developers can fix. Uh, actually, if you use that, the Fedora kernel will benefit from it because if it's fixed early, the bug won't happen, uh, won't actually, will ne never show up in regular Fedora because it will use those kernels later. Actually, you can also use those repositories to check if the bug is fixed in a newer version. Um, or check if the bug you're uh, uh, seeing with Fedora is present upstream to be able to report the bug upstream in case you want it. It looks like this. Uh, it looks a little bit complicated because you, uh, there are like four different repo streams for different, uh, for, for uh, the current uh, Fedora releases. Uh, if you want to get into the details, what's what, uh, look at the wiki. Um, Basically, it's two commands to enable, and DNF will do the legwork later. It will simply update the latest kernel. And if you Google or another use search, uh, search engine, if you Google for Fedora um, kernel vanilla repositories, you will find this page that explains all the details and has an FAQ, uh, FAQ that explains why it might be a good idea to use it or why not. So that was a short distraction. Now I'm getting a little switching the gears a little bit. Um, now I'm showing you what's happening in the Linux kernel right now. I have lots of slides, as you already noticed, and um, I won't make it through all of them, but we can stop at any time. It's kind of a worldwide view, view from 10,000 feet or even higher to see what's up and to look at some interesting pro points like where we are now. Um, but uh, as you um, even there, I will be pr pretty brief sometimes. It's basically to show you a few areas where you might want to look a little bit closer uh, if you're interested. And I'm trying to look back and looking ahead a bit, uh, depending on what it is. <coughs> so, networking. One of the well, I'm about distractions. I think I need something for my uh, voice. So, in networking, one of the um, <coughs> hot topics right now is WireGuard. That's a, a promising new a VPN tunnel um, solution like OpenVPN or IPsec to connect different systems. And uh, it's, I won't go too much into the details. It's stateless. Um, that's important if you switch from one network for the other, the VPN will, um, will, uh, will stay. Well, there won't be any uh, <coughs> uh, service outage. There's easy configuration. Uh, deep in, uh, integration in Linux, um, quick reconnect, a lot of benefits. And um, if you want to know a little bit more about this, uh, there's an Ask Technica article about it. If you Google for WireGuard uh, Ask Technica, you will find it. And actually, the one interesting thing is Line is actually what he nom normally no doesn't is actually stated on a public <coughs> mailing list that he likes it and wants to see it merged. That was already in August last year. It's still not merged. Um, the reason for that is um, this WireGuard is only, I think, three or 4,000 lines of code. And, um, uh, it, but it relies on a new crypto library for the Linux kernel that's called Sync. And um, that is way bigger. I don't know how much lines of code this is, but um, it basically creates a new API in the crypto subsystem in the Linux kernel. And the crypto uh, maintainers don't like that too much because they don't want to man uh, manage two APIs. So they have to find a way um, to integrate those two, and that takes time. If you're interested in more, <coughs> there's an uh, LWNnet article about this 
it's from October or November, I think. And since then, didn't um, not much happen. But I think a new version actually is up for re uh, seems to come out for review so soon. So maybe there will be um, some uh, things moving uh, ahead soon. Package filtering uh, or firewall, as everybody says. Um, Remember NF tables or NF, uh, with the tool NFT for configuration? Uh, it was started in 2011 and really worked on since 2013. A lot of people say, uh, made, uh, made a lot of people say, hey, that never really lifted off. But it lifts off now. It slowly and silently, especially, takes over. And uh, one way how that works is uh, IP tables use, um, uh, IP tables tools package these days. Uh, installs the NF tables and legacy tools in parallel and actually sets uh, a link. So if you're calling IP tables, you in fact might, like in this case, it's using alternatives, um, using the IP tables version that's using the NF table stuff in the Linux kernel. So you might have switched to NF tables without noticing it. And um, actually, that's uh, in progress of firewall <coughs> D0.6 uh, actually. Um, switched to NF tables already. There were uh, was some problems uh, with libvirt and Docker integration. That's why uh, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed and Fedora 29 switched back to using the, the legacy IP tables um, tools. Um, but uh, RHEL 8, Debian 10 um, will actually use uh, the NF table stuff by default. And Fedora is also looking into it. And I'm not sure about the time frame. I thought it was Fedora 30, but it might be that it's uh, Fedora 31 that will make the switch. You, as I said, you won't notice much of this, but if you're running a big firewall, you might want to port your, your rules, um, because if you're porting your rules to um, NFT, you might have additional bene benefits, because NFT and the, the syntax is uh, a lot more efficient. You might think about, uh, might have heard about BP filter. That's a new, um, new uh, filtering technique for the Linux kernel. So you might think, hey, why, why should I port my, my rules from IP table syntax to an NFT, uh, NFT syntax these days if there's a new contender on, on the horizon already? Thing is, um, BP filter is not much more than a, a proof of concept right now. And um, so there's still a lot, lot of work to be done before it can be used for firewalling. And the important thing for, for, for the consideration if you want to port your rules, it changes, um, BP filter changes internals. So in the end, you can use today's NF tables, uh, NFT tools and IP table tools to work with the BP filter. So you don't need to worry too much about the BP filter if it's uh, really starting off and, and, and getting, uh, becoming a shooting star. You can use your rules and tools like you do today, and you will have the benefits um, from the NFT, NFT syntax with, um, with BP uh, filter as well. That's how it looks right, right now. As I said, it's um, uh, working with uh, changes internals. Um, the code is actually looking at the, the packages that are coming in. It's actually um, a customized code uh, that's generated on your, on, your, um, on your system with a local compiler that looks at the rules and then creates a program that does exactly what you want, that avoids overhead and makes it so quick. That's one of the reasons why it's so interesting. And um, uh, re that code, for example, doesn't exist yet. That's actually still the plan, how, how that's, that's supposed to work. So it remains to be seen if that all, all, uh, works out. But it really promises uh, quite, quite a lot of performance improvements. I mentioned this BBF or eBPF um, uh, without explaining it, really. Um, it's basically a small um, VM in the Linux kernel. It was all added over the past few years. Uh, VM like a Java VM, not a, a, a gay VM VM. Um, so it's basically uh, code um, that you can, can run within the Linux kernel. But um, the, the thing is, um, um, it, you can write those programs easier than kernel code. You actually can write those programs on demand or by, by other tools. And that makes things much more flexible. And um, that's what's, uh, why it's so important, for example, for the BPPF. Um, 
case because um, that's compiled with a specific user space helper on demand. But the really new thing is this user space helper to generate your firewalling code, basically, um, is, can be shipped with the Linux kernel in a specific mo module that has kind of a own user space. It's a little bit complicated. It's like uh, you have a, another root partition where only is a compiler for this um, uh, code in it. And uh, that uh, if NF tables or IP tables rules come in, this code will generate an eBPF program and then will back uh, upload this in the kernel. That's quite a new concept. And it remains to be seen how that works out. Uh, in the end, it's, um, uh, uh, the, the, the effect is the boundaries change. Linux becomes more flexible and, and uh, it not that traditionally at anymore. It's uh, not a, a monolithic kernel. It gets even far away from it. Um, there are actually even talks about uh, using file systems in the fuse style uh, to run those in, in, in eBPF because that also promises to be, uh, uh, have uh, performance improvements. It also allows pushing things out of the kernel or in a dedicated area which is still under control of the Linux kernel developers and not under the control of the Linux distributors. Remains to be seen how that all works out. Some people say it's a, a, the Linux kernel gets a more microkernel-like. Um, maybe it is, maybe, maybe it will, maybe it won't. We can talk about this again in, in 10 years. Time will tell. Uh, um, the important thing for now, the BPPF um, is used in more and more places. That's something um, um, that's, uh, if you haven't heard about it, you might want to keep an eye on because it's so important and um, used in uh, more and more places. That's why it gets mentioned so often during the talk. And to give an example of how that um, looks like, there was a Linux Plumbers conference recently. That's one of the most important Linux conferences in the world where developers get together. And there were actually, I didn't count, about uh, a dozen uh, talks uh, just about the BPPF and what it can be used for. It can be used for tracing, um, networking, and, and a lot of other stuff. I'll get through it in the talk. If you uh, Google for LPC to 10, uh, 2019, um, um, and BPF, you will find this page, but it's also mentioned on the slide below. And uh, uh, slides go online um, anyway, so you can just look there. <coughs> Networking again. XDP is also a hot topic. Um, that XDP is a kind of um, express, the, 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 uh, uh, it stands for express data pass, and it's a network fast path um, that relies heavily on BPPF. It basically allows you, for example, to uh, write when the uh, um, package comes in to your computer on the network card before it's really forwarded to the network stack in the um, Linux kernel to, to drop, to look at the package and say, drop this, forward this, re rewrite this, or send, this, send it to some application. And that um, uh, makes it uh, a lot um, that can uh, improve the performance a lot uh, to handle specific cases. And all the other uh, packages you don't uh, get on that, th this level get through the norm normal uh, networking stack and thus um, uh, get handled there uh, normally. So it's really quite interesting that net network developers do a lot of them. Um, Facebook uses this, for example, Cilium um, with, with Catran. Cilium is a container uh, networking technique uh, that's also using, heavily relying on it. It seems um, they are popping up um, use cases for XDP all the time these days. And you can say, see that also on, on the uh, Linux Plumbers Conference program. There was recently uh, a networking track. And um, as you can say, see, not every uh, second, but nearly every second talk was about BP, uh, uh, XDP there. Here are a few examples. Um, if you want to, uh, these, these talks, there are um, abstracts um, there, and some of the video recordings are on the web. If you want to look into this stuff, you can, it's a great resource to learn what's happening there. The most important thing right now that's happening there is um, has zero copy support for AFXDP. That's a technique used by um, 
um, that's uh, uh, technique at, at on kind of for I that that uses XDP to get raw packages right through uh, from the kernel, um, bypass the network stack and get it into the um, uh, your application, and um, to uh, speed up processing as you as I said for packages you're interested in. That uh, might sound familiar to some of you. There's a data plane development kit, DBDK, making a lot of, um, uh, uh, getting a lot of attention in the last few years. And together with a XDP, that might be possible that um, this gets more under control of the kernel uh, again, because DBDK is uh, kind of strange sometimes because it's a real kernel bypass, and the kernel developers don't like that too much. Storage. Um, Asynchronous I.O. Um, is um, something where Linux has a bad reputation. On, on, in the Windows world, it's quite normal. And uh, that's something where the developers are working right now. As a polling infrastructure, um, uh, that's, uh, it, uh, uh, it, it, one developer recently um, uh, improved. And actually, this API is um, kind of inspired by one or was used quite similar in Red Hat Advanced Server 2.1. Who still remembers that? Who was around there? one? <laughs> yeah, even I, I think RHEL 3 was the first I had contact with. Uh, so, so long ago. Yeah, but the really important change right now is still in work in progress. That's this uh, I.O. U-ring. It's a user space ring. Um, that's a, a structure to exchange um, data between the kernel and user space program using a ring buffer. And um, that's cooking for like uh, one or two months these days, so it's really early and not merged in the kernel, but it looks like it will make uh, AIO a proper first-class citizen in the Linux kernel because it's quicker, easier to use, and less quick, less quirks. And uh, that seems to be really promising, and it's also an answer to um, get uh, to uh, avoid or um, 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 uh, bypass technical this is a storage performance start development kit is also client like the DBDK I mentioned earlier, where some app um, actually bypasses the kernel, and this AIO technique is supposed to, to be the answer to that to make sure the kernel stays in control. That's where we like it, or where the kernel developers like it. But as I said, it's still young and work in progress. There's an LWN article about this. Simply go there. Storage. What also changes is do you, um, you might have heard about CFQ and deadline, some schedulers for your um, for your storage device. They actually vanish with uh, Linux 5.0, and they actually vanish with RHEL 8.2 because the changes that are responsible for that are also in RHEL 8. Um, actually, not only those. Uh, uh, schedulers um, vanish, or <coughs> they, the actually old legacy I.O. path in the block layer um, got uh, removed because there was a new block layer infrastructure uh, created over the past few years. It's called block um, multi-queue, block M uh, M uh, M MQ, because uh, uh, that was uh, important for the when NVMe SSDs showed up because you have to use multiple threads and multiple CPUs to get the performance out of these. And that's why this um, storage uh, stack was created. And that's now used everywhere. And um, there are new schedulers for it. It's called, one is called BFQ, and the other is called MQ Deadline. They also have new uh, uh, tuning knobs. So if you are uh, really uh, into um, um, uh, storage performance, you need to learn new tuning knobs. Um, if you just want to use it, your old school um, um, SSD might benefit from, from the uh, multi-queue architecture, and your HDD might benefit from the uh, new scheduler. Um, normally, I talk a lot about file systems here. Um, I'm doing this talk nearly every year. And uh, for example, last year, I um, mentioned there was an XVF, uh, XFS revamp uh, in the works um, with makes, uh, um, uh, that adds uh, some cool features from ButterFS to XFS. That's um, slowly progressing, processing, um, not much to talk about right now. It's the same with ButterFS, there's mainly fine tuning these days. In the file system space, what's interesting right now is FS, 
It's a local uh, file system exchange between, between uh, VMs and the host or other VMs. Um, uh, some might uh, know about um, uh, P9, where, uh, uh, which is used for that. Was it 9P? 9P or P9? I kind of mix it up. 9P. Uh, 9P. 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 Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, and Word.io FS makes this more efficient. That sounds really promising and something also uh, overdue. Um, but it's also quite early. I think the, uh, it was posted early December. Um, that remains to be seen. What's also, uh, was, was al what was already added to the kernel is some di diagnostics infrastructure that's called uh, PSI or pressure stall information. Uh, nobody can remember this, uh, I guess. Uh, what you want to remember is uh, it's uh, proc load average on steroids. So it's really, um, if you have used load average to see, hey, my, why is my machine slow? Okay, uh, or used too much, you, it doesn't help. You see it's used that much, but you don't know why. And the cool thing about uh, PSI is that CPU, MEM, and I.O. are separated. And that uh, looks a little bit like this, and it's a bit strange uh, in the beginning. Um, here, uh, for example, is uh, in the top line is the CPU already. Uh, it's a CPU. Just like in load average, you have the uh, 10 seconds, sec 60 seconds, or 300 seconds. Um, and it actually says how much the um, system was stalled uh, and uh, didn't get uh, to run the CPUs, you, uh, the processes he wants to, wanted to use. So uh, the process had to wait. And there you can, for example, if the CPU was overloaded, you would see that this uh, line. Um, and now you can actually uh, see, uh, thanks to PSI, if I.O. or memory are the problem. Because uh, these uh, stats are here for, uh, for this uh, I.O. and um, memory also. And um, the thing is, you don't have uh, s um, this sum line here. It's called like, uh, like some, some processes got, got stalled and didn't, uh, do, were not able to uh, do their um, I.O. and had to wait. Then it's added to that line, and in the full line, it, it's actually if basically nearly all uh, um, processes got uh, stalled because there was so much load. And if the full line um, is really has high numbers here, and then it it's actually uh, pretty likely that your machine will lo uh, uh, lock up uh, soon because the kernel is, has so much work and, uh, uh, in, in its queue for I/O and can't get it uh, fi find time for it that um, uh, it's pretty likely to log up. Yeah, how much time do we have? Trent, okay, yeah. One minute. One, one minute. Then let, uh, that, uh, it was planned like this that I can jump to the end at any time. Um, one thing um, that's also in the works right now is that real-time Linux, the uh, RT patches, um, a few of you might have heard of that basically uh, add a real-time uh, capacity to the Linux kernel. It looks like those patches actually will get mainlined this year. Um, uh, they are working on, on, on those patches for about oh, uh, 15 years right now uh, to make uh, Linux um, a um, real-time operating system. Um, and uh, kernel developers are not finished yet, uh, but there are also um, preparations for the time uh, after already. If you want to know more about that, you, there was a talk at the Embedded Linux Conference Europe in, in, uh, in October last year, um, which explains what, the, what is still missing, what the kernel developers want to add over the year before the next long-term kernel comes out. And um, it's a lot, good uh, source to to uh, understand what's up there, what real time actually is, because real time doesn't make, is, as a small reminder, real time doesn't make your system faster. It makes it predictable when something happens to, um, and actually some things might get slower um, uh, due to real time. For example, I.O., regular I.O. might get uh, slower to make sure the real time tasks are, are running within the deadline, so it's uh, kind of, you can't have everything at once, you have to slow down something to get some um, um, other things, uh, <coughs> some other be benefits in a different place. A few takeaways. 
want to know more about this stuff, use the search engine. There's um, lots of more details about this. Actually, this presentation has a bit more slides. It will go online. You can look up what I wanted to talk about if I had more time. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but to the main important things is networking. It's uh, VPN stuff. The WireGuard stuff uh, is really cooking. XDP is uh, um, uh, quite important. Changing a lot of things might, might uh, be really uh, 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 something that's pretty normal in, in two or five years from now that everybody will use. In storage, it's um, asynchronous I.O. and the block MQ changes that are important. Both, like, just like the um, XDP stuff, it's our solutions against kernel bypass techniques um, that the kernel developers don't like that much. As I said, eBPF is involved in this uh, quite a lot. It changes, changes the kernel quite a lot. Um, eBPF is also used during, for a lot of tracing stuff. I didn't have time to go uh, into that details, but it's also quite interesting. There were also talks about this yesterday. So look up the videos later on, on, the, on the web from the room yesterday. It's quite a lot of things to learn. Um, security is also a never-ending story, like I mentioned with the Spectra stuff. As I said, there are um, uh, improvements in the work to get um, um, to, to, to make sure the performance uh, gets back. Yeah, um, don't fear the code of conduct. It's not as bad as a lot of people might uh, want to make it sound. And one thing to take away is developer, development in Linux kernel does not slow down. It's really, uh, I'm watching the Linux kernel for 15 years, and it's really quite happening quite a lot. I could talk for, for maybe three or four hours if I had the time, but I, then all of you would be boring and sleeping here. That's uh, way too much. If you want to keep up, I can only suggest um, follow LWN nuts, LWN net, uh, subscribe to it. It's really a good source to know what's cooking in the Linux kernel and related areas. And you might want to follow me on, on social media. Um, actually, I have an account dedicated to kernel stuff. That's a kernel logger account. It's actually on Twitter and also on Friendica. And Friendica can be used from Mastodon on Diaspora as well. Actually, that's just one of six accounts I maintain. Um, I'm a bit crazy, but I'm a Google Plus refugee, and there you had collections to, to sort the stuff you're talking about. And that way I, I'm, I won't uh, annoy you with funny cat pictures in the kernel stuff because I'm ha having a dedicated account for that. Yeah, that's it. Um, please provide feedback. Tell me if you liked it, what you didn't like, and uh, leave feedback for the organizers. They want feedback also. Yeah, that's it. That's it. By the way, that would have been uh, uh, slide 230 if I hadn't skipped a few in the middle. Are there any questions? Or make I, did I make you tired and sleepy here? <laughs> So the question, uh, there were actually two questions. Do you actually fear that the kernel is getting too big? Yeah. Kind of? Kind of. Yeah. And um, so, the, yeah, the kernel grows, that, that's true. And there are sometimes subsystems that are not that well maintained. maintained. But as long, as long as those subsystems don't have security issues, they are not a problem. And the, the, the kernel is, uh, size is also not, not, not a problem. As, because, I mean, if the sources go, go to uh, three, um, uh, 30 million lines or something, in the end, what matters is uh, that you, how you con can configure your kernel to be dedicated to your use case. And um, so that's what, what matters. And uh, I think I, I need to leave it at that because that's a complicated topic. You can't get simply explained in, in one or two months, uh, one or two minutes. Um, be because um, it's, uh, it has 
benefit that's everything in the kernel and the downsides. And that's coming to your second part of your question. Actually, the, um, as you mean, you ask about uh, stuff that's getting the boundaries change and eBPF makes things going to user land. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, and you, you, you mentioned that some things want to be out of the kernel. But no. The, the, the Linux kernel developers um, actually want stuff in the Linux kernel because having everything together is important. Like if you have a, like say USB 4 comes out and um, needs some changes in the subsystem, how the, they work. If you have all the drivers together, you can do these changes. You can change the API because you have all the drivers in one place. And um, that's why the kernel developers normally want everything in the kernel. And that's also, for example, why the kernel developers with the BP filter stuff created this, this uh, mechanism to have some things in, um, in modules, to uh, user space things in, in kernel modules, um, to keep them under control. Because if diff distributions uh, control them, then strings spread out and uh, things start stop uh, breaking. So the kernel developers are normally interested to get as much stuff under their control uh, as possible. OK, right. Any more questions? What I think I uh, you showed us the PSI stuff. The numbers there are number of processes stuck because of human No, uh, time, time stuck. Uh, the, how many uh, processes, uh, 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 how, ma uh, how much time processes got stuck because they were stalled, because uh, they couldn't do I.O. because something else was doing I.O. That's, it's not easy to explain. I actually had, had, had to look up the documentation also and read a few minutes before I get, got a handle of it. Actually, it's in the kernel documentation. Read it up. And then there's also um, a LWNet article about it. And... Um, Actually, was de for, for, of maybe it's of interest, it was developed at uh, Facebook, and they used it to um, uh, increase the, um, the uptime of the servers because they can actually see um, when a process is uh, uh, going haywire and, uh, bef and kill, kill it bef before it uh, crashes the system. Um, uh, ask me or... I think it, it was on the All Systems Open um, from the System D conference. The video is on, on YouTube. When you, if you look, um, see, ah, I, you need to write me a mail and I can point you to it. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you. Enjoy the conference.